Awesome. Hello and welcome to today's Force of Knives webinar today called Food, Hormones and Health, Your Body in Balance. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today with none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Barnard, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, you know, I feel like the world has fundamentally changed over the last two to three weeks. And, uh, you know, we've had many conversations about this, but it's good that we're able to talk about something other than, uh, you know, the current pandemic situation and, you know, try and educate people about how they can change their, uh, their diet to improve their overall health. So thanks so much for being here today. Well, it's a great pleasure. Absolutely. So for those of you who are with us right now, we have, you know, almost a thousand people here already. Uh, do me a favor in the chat box. Um, tell us your name and where you are from. We'd love to hear. We'd love to see what kind of an international audience we have. So please don't be shy. Uh, and then secondarily, also, if you are plant-based, what I would like to know if you if you currently eat a plant-based diet, whether that's a hundred percent plant-based or maybe eighty, ninety percent, just put the number one into the chat box. And if you are currently not plant-based, put the number two into the chat box. And then if you're somewhere in between, maybe put like a 1.5 and then that way we can get a good idea. See lots of, uh, lots of ones, lots of 1.5s coming in. There's definitely some twos as well. I certainly cannot read this fast, so <laughs> I'm going to stop trying. <laughs> so we're, we're very happy to be here today with Dr. Neil Barnard. Now, Dr. Barnard, is an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC, and the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, DC as well, also known as PCRM. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author multiple times over, and he has a new book today, which we're gonna be going into detail about, called Your Body in Balance. Now, Dr. Barnard has led numerous research studies investigating the effect of diet on diabetes, on body weight, and on chronic disease and chronic pain. As a president, as the president of PCRM, uh, he leads programs that advocate for preventative medicine, good nutrition, and higher ethical standards in research. Uh, in 2016, he founded the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and as a model, uh, sorry, the, the PCRM um, institution is a model for making nutrition a routine part of all medical care. Uh, Dr. Barnard is originally from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, he received his MD degree at the George Washington School of Medicine, and he completed his residency at the same institution. Uh, he practiced at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York before returning to Washington to found PCRM. Dr. Barnard, how you doing today? I'm doing great. It's great to be with you today. It's great. Awesome. Uh, in, today's, in today's webinar, Dr. Barnard's going to cover a lot of uh, very interesting information. He's going to explain three things in particular and much more. The three things include, number one, he's going to explain what happens when hormones go haywire and how particular foods can help to bring your hormones back into balance. So he's going to go into detail about what those hormones are and how food has a direct connection with your hormonal physiology. He's also going to provide some insight into the hormones that are hiding in the food that you eat and how your hormonal physiology is influenced by foods that contain hormones from other animals. He's also going to share the science behind how common hormone-related conditions such as weight gain, endometriosis, menstrual pain, and infertility can be improved with very simple and very practical diet changes. Did I miss anything, Dr. Barnard? That, uh, I think that was a fantastic summary. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so we got a total of uh, 1,400 of you guys here in the webinar so far, and probably going to be a lot more coming in. Um, so I see in the chat box there's a lot of people who are giving us the number one, meaning plant-based. There's a lot of people giving us the number 1.5, which means somewhere in between plant-based and animal-based. And then I see, I do see a few twos in here as well, but the majority looks like it's somewhere on the, the 1 to 1.5, which is fantastic. Um, if at any point you guys have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. There's a button that you can press. You can raise your hand. You can ask a question. Uh, we're going to be doing a condensed Q&A at the very end of this webinar, and we want to make sure that we can get to your questions at the end. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is uh, Dr. Cyrus Kambata. Uh, I have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry, and I myself have been living with type 1 diabetes for 
18 years at this point. Uh, I transitioned to a low-fat plant-based whole food diet 17 years ago, and uh, I've seen tremendous, tremendous changes in my own personal health. I'm the co-founder of a company called Mastering Diabetes, and we teach people how to transition towards a plant-based diet, specifically addressing all, all aspects of life with diabetes. Today, I'm going to be a webinar host, but Dr. Barnard is going to be the man of the hour. So now that we have a packed house, uh, Dr. Barnard is going to go into detail again about what, what happens when hormones go haywire and how you can help bring them back into balance. He's going to give some insight into the hormones that are hiding in foods, where you can find them and what type of effect they have. And then he's going to share some science behind how common hormone related conditions, uh, such as weight gain, endometriosis, menstrual pain, and infertility can be improved very simply. Dr. Barnard, it is all you. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much. Sorry. Absolutely. Let me share my screen. There we are. Um, I'd like to talk about hormones, as, as Cyrus mentioned. And for those of you who are new to the concept of healthy eating, I think you're going to find everything that I'm saying to be uh, new and interesting. If you're already following a plant-based diet, I think you're going to be surprised too, because the conditions that foods affect go way beyond the things you're used to, like body weight or cholesterol or cancer risk or that kind of thing. Um, they go to many other things, um, menstrual pain, infertility, things that we would never really associate with foods. So let's dive in. Uh, for me, this all began with a phone call. I was sitting here at my desk and a young woman called. She had terrible menstrual pain. Now for many women, they have some pain every month, but for about one in 10, it's off the scale can't go to work today type pain. And that was her situation. So she called and described her situation. And this is what she told me. This was misery for her and it happened about every single month. So I suggested something to her that might have sounded a bit unusual. I said, well, for the next couple of days, we can use painkillers and I can give you pretty heavy duty painkillers if you'd like. However, let's see if we can stop this from happening again next month. And so I suggested two things, avoiding all animal products and keeping oils very low. Now, I'm sure that surprised her. How could, that, how could those changes affect menstrual pain? How could that be? But she agreed to, to try it. And four weeks later, she gave me a call back and she said, this is amazing. Her period arrived with no pain at all. And month after month, she was effectively cured. So here's the prescription. For, for the next four weeks, I said, no animal products, keep oils very low. Now, if you're following a plant-based diet already, you might think, well, I'm pretty good with number one, but what about number two? Okay, hold that thought. Um, because this uh, was very effective for her as an individual, I decided to do a randomized clinical trial. With, we did this with Georgetown University's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And we asked a group of women, all of whom had pain, uh, half, we asked half of them to start the low-fat vegan diet, the other half began a supplement which was in fact a placebo, just what you'd call a dummy pill. And they did that for two months and then they switched. The diet group started the supplement, the supplement group started the diet. And what we were tracking was pain, PMS symptoms, other things that the women had been experiencing month after month. And what we discovered is that it works. We published our findings in a, a journal called the Obstetrics and Gynecology. And to make a long story short, pain intensity dropped but not only that, PMS symptoms like bloating and water retention and moodiness improved as well. Now, in the course of this study, we asked all the participants not to use any hormone medications because that could confuse our study. And that included the pill. So if women were sexually active, we asked them to use contraception that was not the birth control pill because that's a hormone. And one of the women in the study said, Dr. Barnard, you don't have to worry about me. My husband and I don't use any contraception at all. Uh, she said that they had both been evaluated for why she couldn't get pregnant. And she said, it's not him, it's me. I just don't ovulate. Well, the second month that she was on the low-fat vegan diet, she came into our research center and said, Dr. Barnard, I've got some, some bad news and I've got some good news. Uh, the bad news is I'm leaving your study. The good news is I am pregnant. <laughs> she was pregnant. Uh, she gave birth to a healthy baby 
And then a little bit while, uh, a little after that, she gave birth to a second healthy baby, and then she had a third child. Um, and th this is a woman who had a diagnosis not only of dysmenorrhea, meaning menstrual pain, but also infertility. And those diagnoses were gradually being erased by a diet change. So wait a minute, what are hormones anyway? Let's walk through this. Okay, hormones are like letters that go in the mail. Um, thyroid hormone goes from your thyroid gland to the base of your neck. It reaches the cells of the body and it gives them energy. Or in a woman's body, estrogens come from the ovaries and they go to the uterus and the other sexual organs to get them ready for pregnancy. And in a man's body, the testes make testosterone, which, well, I, I guess testosterone gets into the man's blood and goes to his brain and makes him want to run for president. Um, you get the idea. Hormones go from one place to another, and there they give it directions, tell it what to do, just like a letter in the mail. But you can run into hormone haywire in two ways. One is not having enough letters in the mail, not enough hormones. The other is you might have too much in the way of hormones, too many letters, you can't manage it. So having too little hormones is not good, having too much hormones is, is not good, you wanna be in balance. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. The woman said she had terrible menstrual pain. What's that about? How's that related to food? Okay, so the graph you're seeing now is estrogen, the female sex hormone in a woman's bloodstream. Now, in fact, there are several different kinds of estrogen, estrone, estradiol, estriol, I'm just gonna lump them together for now and call them estrogens, female sex hormones. At the beginning of the month, as you can see, there's not much estrogen in the woman's blood, but after about two weeks, it rises to a peak and then it falls. She's ovulating, the ovary is releasing an egg. And then over the next week, the amount of estrogen gradually rises again. And that's because the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month it's convinced, I'm gonna get pregnant this time for sure. And so the amount of estrogen is rising. What's it, what it's doing, it's gradually thickening the inner lining of the uterus to get it ready for pregnancy. But then after about a week, the disappointed uterus discovers we are not pregnant after all, and the amount of estrogen falls, and that thickened uterine lining breaks up and is discarded with menstrual flow. Here's the point. This whole process can be changed based on the foods you eat. If you eat the wrong foods, the amount of estrogen can get too high. If you eat healthy foods, the amount of estrogen can come back down to a healthy level. And that can change what's happening inside your uterus. Really? Let's have a look. This is the uterus. And you see that pink layer inside? That's the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus. And you see the ovaries over on the sides, uh, connected by the fallopian tubes. All right. So every month, that uterine lining thickens up. There it is, see it thickening? That's normal. But if I'm not eating in a healthy way, what appears to happen is that uterine lining can thicken up too much, and as it does, it produces maladjusted chemicals called prostaglandins that cause pain. So when the young woman called me up on the phone, she said, I can't get out of bed, I've got terrible pain. I was going through in my mind's eye what's happening to her physiologically too much endometrial thickening in the course of the month, causing prostaglandins to hit her with pain. And I then made an educated guess that a low fat vegan diet would control the estrogen, the amount of estrogens in the blood. Okay, how is that gonna be true? How could foods, yes, foods can affect our cholesterol or our digestion, but estrogen, how does that happen? Well, let's, uh, let me answer that by telling you another story of an individual who went through this. This is Catherine. Catherine uh, grew up in Louisiana. She was in the Air Force, an aerospace engineer. And in fact, she was one of the first people to go into Iraq in 2003. And when you're in a war zone and you're working really hard and you're eating what the government provides, um, you don't gain any weight. Um, but as time went on uh, and her uh, tour of duty came to an end, the government decided to ship her back home. And when she got back home, uh, her family and friends took her out to eat. And they were, the idea was to make up for all the foods that she had missed when she was overseas. So what did she miss the most? 
cheese, mac and cheese, cheese snacks. These were things that she loved and she had, had, was now making up for lost time. In fact, a friend uh, for her birthday gave her an entire case of macaroni and cheese dinners, 48 boxes, which Catherine ate for 48 days straight. I'm not making this up. Um, she gained weight, but she developed some symptoms also. She started having pain in her abdomen. And as the weeks went by and the months went by, it got worse and worse and worse. And finally, a gynecologist said, let's do a laparoscopic exam. This is where you make an incision below the belly button. You put in a scope and you look into the abdomen. And the doctor said, we've got our diagnosis. It's endometriosis. This is a condition where the cells that line the uterus, the endometrium, those cells are escaping. We believe they go out through the fallopian tubes and they then implant all around the abdomen. They can implant on your intestinal tract, on the fallopian tubes, on the ovaries, and they can cause pain, but not just pain. They can cause infertility. They can damage the ovary. They can damage the, the fallopian tubes. The doctor gave her painkillers, hormonal treatments, nothing really worked. She got to the point where she really could not function because of this continuing pain. So her doctor suggested one other thing. We can do a hysterectomy. Well, Catherine was 27 years old and she and her husband were sort of newlyweds, I could say. They hadn't raised a family yet. Um, and so Catherine was a bit reluctant to have all of her uh, insides removed. But the doctor said, look, I don't want to disappoint you, but you're probably infertile anyway because of the seriousness of the disease. This is stage four endometriosis you have. It's all around your abdomen. You're probably infertile. Okay. So she went ahead and agreed to the hysterectomy. They scheduled it for six weeks later, but before she could have the procedure, a friend convinced her to go see a nutrition expert. And the nutrition expert looked at her diet and took all the mac and cheese out put her on a vegan diet, in fact, a totally plant-based diet, but not just a plant-based diet, a very healthy diet, a very basic diet, very low fat, and she started to feel better. As the weeks went by, the pain changed. It diminished in quality. It wasn't entirely gone, but it was much better. But a dutiful patient, six weeks went by, she arrived at the operating room for her procedure. They anesthetized her. And the doctor again inserted the, laparos the laparoscope through a laparoscopic incision uh, and was prepared to remove her uterus through the laparoscope. About an hour later, Catherine woke up in the recovery room and the doctor was there. He said, Catherine, I need to tell you something. Your endometriosis is effectively gone. I didn't feel good about doing the hysterectomy. I, I, you had scarring all over the place. You had some adhesions that I had to remove. But other than that, I mean, the endometriosis is effectively gone. I've, I've left your uterus in place. I didn't do the hysterectomy. And her mother was there in the recovery room with her. And the mother explained, she went vegan. Uh, and the doctors, the doctors threw some uh, cold water on that and said, no, 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 no. Foods don't cause endometriosis. And there's no way that a diet change we could ever make it go away. Um, this must be a miracle. Well, the doctor had the idea that a miracle had cured her. Now, let, let me uh, say some kudos for this doctor for not taking out her uterus. When he recognized she didn't need the operation, he didn't do it. Good on him. However, what he missed was endometriosis is a condition that's driven by estrogens, female sex hormones, and a diet change can indeed change estrogens in a big way. By the way, there's Catherine. She lost a lot of weight. She now has three children. She never had the hysterectomy. Um, she doesn't have endometriosis anymore. In fact, she joined the Physicians Committee to be one of our Food for Life instructors. And now she teaches at a center in Dallas. Helps, she helps other women to take advantage of what we know about food and to take back their own health. Okay, so cheese. Hormones, does cheese contain hormones? Well, cheese comes from milk, which comes from a cow. And to produce milk, cows have to be pregnant and have to give birth. And so on farms, cows are impregnated every single year. Um, and when they give birth, they, are, they then start producing milk, which um, 
the, cow, the, the farmers keep, obviously, as you know, they remove their calves. The calves, the female calves are put in uh, an isolation hutch and the male calves are killed for veal. It's um, not a very cheerful um, procedure, but that's what happens. A cow's gestation is about nine months. And during this nine month uh, period, uh, they are milked for much of it. In, in other words, the cows are milked while they are pregnant and most of the milk that you ever drank most of the cheese that you ever consumed or ice cream came from milk out of a cow who was pregnant. So if the estrogens during the pregnancy get into the, into the blood plasma, much more will get into the milk. Okay, so there is no such thing as hormone-free milk. I'm not talking about hormones that the, that the, the, the uh, farmers inject. I'm talking about hormones made in the cow's body. Milk always contains estrogens. And you'll swallow them if you're eating dairy products. Okay, could this affect a woman's health? Could it affect a man's health? Okay, researchers went into a fertility clinic and they looked at men uh, who ate either very little cheese or ate a lot of cheese. The bar on the left here is the people, the, the men who ate relatively little cheese, half serving a day. Um, and the bar shows that they had a relatively healthy sperm count. The uh, right-hand bar is the men cons consuming more cheese, uh, one to one to two and a half servings of uh, cheese every day. And as you can see, they have a much lower sperm count. And researchers have looked not only at sperm counts, but also what we call morphology and motility, meaning is the shape of the sperm okay? Uh, do they swim straight? Um, it looks like the traces of hormones in cheese are, even though it's only a trace, it's enough to affect a man's fertility. Really? Well, think about it. Your average man eats about 35 pounds of cheese every year, plus milk, plus ice cream, plus yogurt, plus butter, plus all the dairy products that are baked into cookies and cakes and all kinds of other things. Um, so you're getting measurable amounts of estrogen. It's not much, but it's enough to affect your body. Okay, men, don't go to sleep. I have one other thing I need to tell you. This scenario occurs all the time. The man goes into the doctor's office and says, Doc, um, I'm having problem, problems with my, my nature. And the doctor says, I'm not quite sure I follow. Uh, the man says, Doc, I can't raise the flag. Ah, erectile dysfunction. That's it, Doc. Uh, so the patient wants a Viagra prescription. The doctor can write it out. Um, at which point the patient takes the prescription, runs out, thanks very much, uh, you helped me a lot. The doctor at that point drops his prescribing pen and runs out after the patient says, stop, 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 we're not done yet, please come back in. The patient sits down and the doctor says to the patient, the reason that you have erectile dysfunction, it's not caused by performance anxiety. It's caused by atherosclerosis. What is that, the patient says. You have particles of cholesterol in your blood. They're irritating the artery wall and the artery wall starts to develop little bumps, little almost like blisters. And the more they form, the narrower the passage for blood through that artery. These little blisters are narrowing the passageway so you're not getting blood flow. And you're not getting blood flow to your private parts. And the male sexual anatomy is sort of a hydraulic system. It was obviously devised on a Monday because things are going wrong with it all the time. Um, if it doesn't get good blood flow, nothing happens. Are you with me? So what the doctor then explains is it's not just that you have narrowed arteries to your private parts leading to impotence or erectile dysfunction. If you have atherosclerosis there, you almost certainly have it in the coronary arteries to your heart and in the carotid arteries going to your brain meaning that you are at higher than average risk of a heart attack or stroke within the next three to five years. Viagra does not treat any of that. So yes, you could take Viagra that will momentarily allow a man to, get, to set aside his erectile dysfunction, but his narrowed arteries are gonna to continue to worsen. So the, the doctor says, before you leave, I want you to make an appointment with a dietitian and learn about the only diet that makes that, or those artery blockages go away, and that's a low-fat vegan diet. <clears throat> meaning it has no cholesterol in it because it's only plants. It has no animal fat in it, okay. All right, so cheese has estrogens in it 
and the estrogens can affect a man's fertility and animal products in general can cause our artery narrowings. Well, what else affects our hormones? Okay, uh, this is the liver. The liver controls your hormones to a degree. The liver has a way of removing excess estrogen. And here's what it does. The liver filters the blood, it finds the excess estrogen, it sends it down that green bile duct into the intestinal tract. And there, fiber from the foods that you've eaten, fi fiber is plant roughage, the fiber grabs a hold of that estrogen and carries it out with the waste. You're literally flushing away excess estrogens. But wait a minute, what if your lunch was chicken breast? Does it have fiber in it? Well, let me ask you, does it? No, chicken breast is not a plant. To get fiber, plant roughage, you've got to eat plants, like beans or vegetables or fruits or whole grains. Um, animal products don't have it. So that's true for yogurt, it's true for meat, it's true for chicken, it's true for fish. So if you're eating animal products and you're not getting adequate fiber, the liver still removes that excess estrogen. It still sends it into the intestinal tract, but without the fiber there, the estrogens pass into the bloodstream. They're reabsorbed back into the bloodstream and eventually they'll make their way back to the liver, which sends them back to the intestine again, but there's still no fiber there. So this cycling of hormones continues and a woman has too much estrogen in her blood every minute of every day and a man does too. Okay, I wanna make sure everyone was paying attention. Spam, does it have fiber or no fiber? No fiber, that's right. It's from an animal, animal products don't have fiber. So this is a trash can and the spam can go right in. Um, KFC, fiber or no fiber? Ah, well, there is a little bit of fiber if you eat the carton. Um, other than that, sorry, it can go away too. Now, there are some foods that started out as plants, but they became unrecognizable. And as part of the process, bad things were added and the fiber was removed. So we can toss that stuff out too. Okay, you with me? High fiber foods can help remove excess estrogens, including the ones that cheese added to your diet. Now, does this really matter? We've been talking about menstrual pain. We've been talking about infertility. We've talked about endometriosis. These conditions are not gonna kill you. But hormones can affect our risk of breast cancer. Let me walk you through this. These little dots are estrogens. Estrogens can go right through the cell membrane. That's a breast cell. And once they're inside the cell, they can pass through the nuclear membrane into the center of the nucleus. They can attach to your DNA. Once estrogen attaches to the DNA, it can damage it, causing that cell to become a cancer cell that divides, and it can spread throughout your body. Wait a minute, you might be now thinking, my body makes estrogen. Are you saying that that can be carcinogenic? The hormone that my own body makes can kill me? The answer is yes. This is true for most all hormones. If you don't have enough insulin, you can die. If you have too much insulin, you can die. If you have too little thyroid hormone or too much thyroid hormone, the same is true. Growth hormone, if you have too little or if you have too much, these can harm your health and that's true of estrogen. You don't wanna to have too little, you don't wanna to have too much, you want to get your body in balance. Okay, so to illustrate this, this is the amount of estro estradiol in a woman's blood and as you can see, the higher or the more the higher the estrogen level, which means going from the left to the right, the higher the risk of developing breast cancer. So the women in what we call the fifth quintile, that's the, the highest amount of estrogen, have about two and a half times the risk of breast cancer compared to the women uh, with the least amount of estrogen in their blood. So it pays to get your estrogen back into balance. All right, so we've talked about female sex hormones and all the mischief that they can cause, but let's shift gears. Let's talk about the thyroid. The thyroid is at the base of your neck and it oversees your body's use of energy. And you can be low in thyroid where your thyroid gland isn't making the normal amount. Um, that can leave you fatigued and tired. You get up in the morning and you just don't have any energy. You're sensitive to cold, you're constipated, you're gaining a little weight, uh, you feel crummy, your skin and hair don't seem, don't seem healthy. So you go to the doctor. And the doctor says, well, all these symptoms are pretty nonspecific, but because they're in this cluster, let's do a blood test. 
And the doctor says, aha, you don't have enough thyroid hormone. Now the opposite can happen too. You're hyperthyroid. You've got too much thyroid hormone. And that leads usually to weight loss, although sometimes weight gain. But now you're revved up. Your pulse is faster. You're nervous. You feel warm. You might even have a tremor and you're going to feel, you're going to have trouble sleeping. You're just revved up in an uncomfortable way and your skin and your hair don't seem, don't seem healthy either. Okay. So what's causing this? Two things. The first, you see those little purple dots there? This is thyroid hormone and, and iodine, that's what those purple dots are, are, iodine is critical for making thyroid hormone. If you don't have iodine in your diet, you can't make thyroid hormone. Ah, well, actually this is not much of a problem in the United States because in, in 1924, the Morton Company started marketing iodized salt with a little girl and the umbrella on it. And that really dramatically reduced the likelihood of of iodine deficiency. However, we're modern people. We have sea salt or kosher salt or Himalayan salt. And these may not have any iodine in them unless it specifically says so on the package. So suddenly you wake up and you don't have, you don't have any energy and you're gaining weight and you go to the doctor who says you're low in thyroid. Putting iodine back into your diet, it will help. Now, iodized salt is not the only source. Dairy products, oddly enough, are a source Although before you rush out to the dairy case, let me tell you how it gets in there. Uh, the, the teats of a cow's udder get caked with all kinds of stuff, as you, as you can imagine, milk, fecal material, dirt. And so the dairy farmers use a disinfectant on the teats and it gets, some of that disinfectant will then get into the milk when the cows are milked. That's what, yes, that's where the iodine is coming from. It also sometimes is fed to cows. They feed them iodine, and so it ends up in their milk. So, so no, cows do, do not make iodine. So and dairy does have it, but it's from either the feed or the disinfectant. Uh, not the best source, but there's actually a really kind of good source, and that's sea vegetables. If you go to a sushi bar, uh, don't order the fish sushi unless you're very well insured. Um, but if you order the cucumber roll or the asparagus roll or the, the sweet potato roll, that nori seaweed, that, that green seaweed that it's wrapped in, like all seaweeds, it's high in iodine. Have some uh, miso soup with it. The wakame strips that are in the miso soup, high in iodine. Or I don't know if you're familiar with arame. Arame is a very thin, delicate seaweed. And the best salad you ever had is made by taking a cucumber, slice it real thin, and then lay it out on a plate, put a little salt on top, and put some arame that you've soaked on. It's just very delicate. And now sprinkle on a little uh, seasoned rice vinegar. Delicious. In fact, in my book, Your Body in Balance, I have a recipe of exactly that that I'm gonna share with you. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, now, although worldwide iodine deficiency is the, most re is the most common reason why people run hypothyroid, in the United States, there's actually a more common reason, and that's antibodies. Antibodies are, they're like torpedoes. White blood cells make them and they attack viruses. They attack bacteria, they attack cancer cells that arise in your body. But sometimes antibodies form in your, in your body and they attack your thyroid gland. Um, and here are the names of them. These, this will not be on the test, but these antibodies form in your body and antibodies can do two things. They can attack the thyroid, slowing down its ability to make thyroid hormone. In other cases, they attack the thyroid regulatory machinery so your thyroid can't turn off. And you're now hyperthyroid because your body can't stop making the hormone. But either way, it's antibodies. Um, for extra credit, I'll tell you the names. If you have an antibody attack that is slowing down your thyroid, that was discovered by a Japanese doctor named Hashimoto, Dr. Hashimoto. Uh, he has this disease named after him, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, the condition where antibodies are causing the, the uh, thyroid to overproduce, that was discovered by a doctor named Robert Graves. So it's called Graves' disease. That's hyperthyroidism. Okay, so could foods trigger this problem? Well, the Adventist Health Study, too, gave us a partial answer to that question. Now, as you probably know, Adventists have been put under the microscope by researchers for decades. And the reason is that Adventists, by church teachings, 
are very, very health conscious. You suddenly have this huge population of non-smokers, teetotalers, health conscious people, but some of them are vegans, some are vegetarian, some are pescatarian, some are meat eaters, and now you can compare the different diet groups with, without, being, uh, without worrying about the fact that some might be smokers or drinkers or whatever. Um, so it's a, it's a great population to study. And what researchers discovered is that hypothyroidism is least common in people following a vegan diet and most common in people who follow a lacto-ovo vegetarian diet. What does that mean? Lacto is milk, milk products, of course. Ovo is eggs. So lacto-ovo vegetarians don't eat any meat, but they might make up for it with cheese, eggs, and they have the highest risk for hypothyroidism. Now, hyperthyroidism, a little bit different. Once again, the people who avoid all animal products have the least risk, but the people who have the most risk are the people who not only eat the milk and the eggs, but also the meat. How would we explain that? What we believe is happening is that the foreign proteins, the, the animal proteins that people are ingesting are recognized by the immune system as foreign and are triggering the production of antibodies that either damage the thyroid directly or damage its regulatory machinery, okay? So we need more research on this. No one has yet done a randomized clinical trial testing a completely plant-based diet to see if it could either prevent hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism or reverse these. However, there are a lot of people who have decided not to wait and they've adopted plant-based diets on their own. And what we've seen is many, many individual cases where people have improved by avoiding animal products. By improved, I mean they were able to reduce the amount of thyroid hormone they were taking as a supplement for, for, for um, hypothyroidism, or they became well, where they didn't need uh, treatment at all. And the same has been shown for some cases of hyperthyroidism. Now, as in every other aspect of what I'm talking about in this lecture, don't cancel your doctor's appointment. Don't throw away your medications. Talk with your doctor and let your doctor know what you're gonna be doing, that you're gonna be trying out a, a healthy diet. There is never a reason not to do a healthy plant-based diet. And if you wanna put it to work to see if it improves your thyroid function, by all means do. Okay, one more program that I wanna talk about and that is insulin. Insulin uh, plays a key role in, in sugar management. And let me walk you through this. Insulin comes from the pancreas behind your belly button and it travels through the bloodstream and it arrives at the cells of the body. And once it arrives at the cells, it allows sugar to come into the cell. Insulin is like a key. It opens up little channels to let that sugar come inside. So we did uh, a, a research study in type two diabetes. And in type two diabetes, your body is still making insulin, but the cells are not responding to it very well. Um, our research study tested a conventional diabetes diet versus a plant-based diet. And a conventional diet, as you know, means limit calories to lose weight, uh, limit the amount of carbohydrate that you eat um, so that you're not overwhelming the amount of sugar in the blood. The plant-based diet was quite different. It wasn't concerned about how much carbohydrate people ate. It, what it, instead, it threw out the animal products and it kept oils very, very low. The test that we use to track how people with type 2 diabetes are doing, or type 1 for that matter, is called hemoglobin A1C. And if a person has diabetes, I want to have it be below about seven. And it's just a measure of your blood sugar control over the preceding three months or so. And as you can see on this slide, the, the red line is the people on the conventional diet or the so-called ADA diet, uh, uh, American Diabetes Association diet. They did well. Their A1C dropped by about 0 0.4 absolute percentage points, that's good. But the blue line is the people on the vegan diet. And as you can see, they dropped three times more, uh, a drop of about 1.2 absolute percentage points. That's huge. Okay, uh, let me put a human face on this. This is Vance. Vance is one of our first research participants. Um, when he came in and we asked him why he wanted to volunteer for the study, he told me that not only did he have diabetes, but it was all up and down his family tree. And to him, he said, diabetes means I'll probably lose a leg, go blind. Vance's father was dead by age 30. Vance himself was 31 when he was diagnosed with this disease. He came in to see us in his late 30s. 
and he began the vegan diet. And one of the first things that he told me was that this diet was very, very easy. And I said, Vance, a vegan diet is easy? People think of it as hard, you know? They, 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 they might think, well, you've got to have a taste for folk music to be vegan, or you got to wear tie-dye clothes, or work in a library, or say you're a philosopher. He said, no, no. A vegan diet is the easiest diet he'd ever been on. And, and because the previous diet said, okay, to get your diabetes under control, you need to cut calories. So the dietitian makes a, a menu for you that adds up to about 500 calories less than you'd like to eat. So you're hungry all the time and you have to count carbohydrate grams and it's a big pain. And he said, you know, you don't make me do any of that. You just say, instead of meat chili, have bean chili. Instead of Alfredo sauce on your spaghetti, have tomato sauce. How hard is that? Anybody can do it. Uh, after a year, he lost about 60 pounds. He stopped his diabetes medications. And his hemoglobin A1C dropped from 9.5, which is terrible, to 5.3, which is normal. And I want to tell you, I was, well, when I got his lab result, I have to tell you, I walked around my office for about 15 minutes trying to decide if I could tell Vance that he no longer has diabetes. Here was a man on no medications with an absolutely normal A1C level. Now, but I had been taught in medical school that once you have diabetes, you'll always have diabetes. Happily now, we've gotten used to the idea that diabetes can re be reversed. As, as Cyrus and his wonderful team know, that diabetes very often goes away if you make the right kind of diet changes. Let me walk you through how this happens. This is my most important slide. I want to show you how insulin works, where insulin resistance comes from. This is the first step in developing diabetes. Okay, there's glucose, those little pink dots. That glucose needs to get into that cell to power. That big blue thing, that's a cell, like a muscle cell. To get the glucose inside the cell, it has to go through those funny little purple channels and it can't do it without a key. The key is insulin and insulin attaches to those red receptors just like a key in a lock. And when the key arrives at the receptor, it signals those channels to open and now here comes the glucose inside the cell. There it is, okay? If a person has type two diabetes, they still got insulin, They've got receptors, that's not the problem. The problem is that the insulin is having trouble opening up those channels. And the reason why, you can see it on this slide. You see those yellow blobs? That's beef fat, or chicken fat, or fish oil, or, or fryer grease, or olive oil, or extra virgin olive oil, or extra extra virgin olive oil. The fats you eat pack into your cells and cause insulin to not be able to signal. If your cells are filled with fat, the insulin can't get the sugar inside. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it only has three letters, so we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, but that means fat inside your muscle cells. So how much fat is there on a vegan diet? Well, there isn't any animal fat at all. And if I keep the oils low, there's not much of any kind of fat, and that fat inside the cell, that intramyocellular lipid, starts to diminish. That happens in the liver, and in the muscle cells. So the hepatocellular lipid in the, the liver starts to drain out and the intramyocellular lipid in the muscles starts to diminish as well. Okay, here's my point. Your body can heal. We talked about a young woman with menstrual pain or, or a woman with infertility or someone with painful endometriosis or people with thyroid diseases or diabetes. We're just scratching the surface, but as you'll see, the body can heal. Well, of course it can heal. You know that if you cut your hand, the Band-Aid doesn't heal you, does it? It just protects you. Inside the DNA of every cell is a program that allows the cells to reconnect. So if your cells have been, been disrupted, you cut your hand, they will rejoin again. It won't be perfect, there will be a scar, but you can heal. If you break your leg, a cast doesn't heal you. It just holds the bones still so that the bones can, can heal. The program for healing the bones is inside every single bone cell. In your arteries, your arteries have the capacity to heal against atherosclerosis. But in the same way that your a cut will never heal if you keep picking at it and your, your bones will never heal if you have a loose cast that allows the bones to wiggle around and your arteries will never heal if you keep eating cheese and meat and eggs that, have, that, that increase the particles of cholesterol in your blood, your body will never heal unless you take away the insult. But once we do, with a plant-based diet, 
keeping the oils low, eating healthy vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, the body has the capacity to heal. It's not perfect, but we want to put it to work. So this is my new book, Your Body in Balance. And whenever I get excited about something that I had never heard of, like endometriosis could be uh, addressed by diet or hypothyroidism or menstrual cramps or all these kinds of things, I put it in a book and I try to package it in a way that people can use. And let me tell you about this. The first part of Your Body in Balance talks about sex hormones. So that's fertility and cramps and PMS and uh, cancer. Both for women, we talked about breast cancer, but also for men, prostate cancer. Uh, polycystic ovaries, menopausal symptoms, all of these things are covered. And then in part two, we're gonna talk about hormones, metabolism, and even mood. So yes, we'll talk about diabetes and thyroid conditions, your skin, your hair, and even depression, anxiety, and stress. Can foods affect all of those? Absolutely. And then in part three, we're gonna talk about feeling better again. So that means what's a healthy diet? And I'll, put, I'll guide you through the healthy four food groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans. If you're familiar with this part already, we'll talk about how to keep oils really low, best sources of iodine. Do you need vitamin B12? The answer is yes. We'll get you on a healthy diet, but we're gonna go further. You're probably exposed to environmental chemicals. Where are they? How do I avoid them? I'll show you. Uh, there are menus and there are recipes. And I wanna say a big shout out to Lindsay S. Nixon, the, the happy herbivore. Lindsay Nixon is a genius in the kitchen and she created four, uh, 65 recipes that are all part of your body in balance. And when she sent me these recipes, which I wanna tell you are lovely, they're easy, they're quick to make, but really delicious. Uh, she also sent me a note that said, Dr. Barnard, this healthy way of eating cured my cramps too. So let's call that validation. So to summarize, a lot of people have the idea that foods cause me to get sick. Diabetes, high cholesterol, whatever the case may be, that's right. But let's be more sophisticated about it. If you know how foods control your hormones, you suddenly have control over all kinds of things that you never imagined could have anything to do with foods at all. <clears throat> the final thing that I just wanna say is I hope you've enjoyed this, pro this program. I hope you find it useful. But the people who need this the most are not watching this program. That's because they're 12 years old and they're in school and they're eating chicken nuggets. And on the way home, they stop at the 7-Eleven and they get some string cheese. And then at dinner time, their, their parents put a pepperoni and cheese pizza in the oven and that's what they're eating. And when the girl is 15 years old and she's doubled up with pain uh, because of menstrual cramps and she goes to see the, the school nurse, the nurse says, well, welcome to adulthood. And at age 30, uh, when, when a couple is struggling with infertility, uh, they're told this is God's will. This is not God's will. This might be Kraft's will, but it has nothing to do with anything, uh, anything else. It, it has to do with biology. Uh, or a person's diagnosed with cancer, they're told it's genetic. Well, it may be in some cases, but if we change our diet, we have power that we never had before. And my message is, let, yes, let's learn about this together. But what we have to do more, that's really more important than anything else is connect with people who don't know about this. I mean, share information with them. And the best way to do this, in my view, is social media. If you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, you're on whatever, um, or if you're just over the water cooler talking with, with friends and colleagues, share with them this information, share with them a recipe, share with them new product, new shows, new programs, this program, share this program with other people so that they can take advantage of this as well. Um, and lastly, uh, because of the situation that we're in now, a lot of people are afraid to go to their doctor. They're um, unsure, they, they, they want some uh, specific medical advice, they want a dietitian, they don't know where to go. And so we have a nonprofit clinic that Cyrus mentioned at the beginning, and I just want to mention this to you. Um, we provide telemedicine. So if you're in California and you're, you don't have a doctor or you're afraid to go to a doctor, you can call us and our doctors, nurse practitioner, dietitians will see you. We can talk about your diet, we can order lab tests, we can order x-rays, um, and we can provide uh, medical care. So in California, in Maryland, Missouri, New York, Virginia, Washington, DC, um, oh, and also Massachusetts uh, added to the list. In all of these states, we provide telemedicine. Just call the number on your screen, 202-527-7500. We'd be glad to make an appointment uh, for you or go to barnardmedical.org. 
uh, one of our practitioners would be glad to see you. There's no reason uh, to let illness uh, hold you back. Diet changes are not perfect. The body is vulnerable. You can be on a perfect diet and still get ill, but let's put, the, uh, put a healthy diet to work. Let's see how far it can go for us and let's spread this to everybody else so that we can change this world. Thank you very much. Wow, Dr. Barnard, <laughs> uh, as you were going through this presentation, I literally was thinking to myself, I was like, I've heard Dr. Barnard present many times. I've interviewed him many times and I've just heard presentations at, at lectures at, at conferences and beyond. This presentation was by far the best presentation I've ever heard from you. And I, and I really do mean that because one of the things that I think is so powerful about what you just communicated is that you're giving people an instruction manual that teaches them how the food that they eat can not only cause many metabolic conditions that result in a whole plethora of, of symptomology, but you can also use your food as the remedy. And the way that your food does it is by controlling, amongst other things, how your hormonal physiology functions. And by doing so, you can improve your thyroid health, your kidney health, your liver health, your muscle health, your sexual organ health, your brain health, and beyond. So it's a really, really, really cool message. And I, I appreciate all the information that you just shared with us. Well, thank you, Cyrus. Uh, and all the side effects are good ones. Yeah, exactly. Right. All the side effects are good ones. And I mean, quite honestly, it just, it just tastes fantastic. A plant-based diet is a, I, I, I joke about the fact that I eat dessert for breakfast every single day, you know, and it's been that way for many years now. So, you know, before we move on to the Q and A, um, I, I want to share a couple of things here about the Forks Over Knives team, because uh, the Forks Over Knives team is really here to, to improve the quality of your life. And they have a true, true, true dedication to you guys and to their community at whole. So connecting, you know, Forks Over Knives tries to connect experts like Dr. Barnard with you. And the reason is for that is, is because they want to help you live a healthy and happy life. And it literally is just that simple. So I'm gonna share my screen here for a second and uh, give you guys a couple of uh, ideas here for ways that you can get involved in some digital products that the Forks Over Knives team have created. Uh, let me figure out how to share my screen. All right, can you share, can you see my screen right now? Full screen? Okay. So here we go. Uh, you know, making whole food plant-based eating is actually easy and enjoyable and accessible for everyone uh, and has never been more important than it is in today's world. Now, we know that you've probably had to make some major adjustments to your routine recently, uh, and it may be challenging to create nutritious meals, especially if you're new to plant-based eating. So in the chat box, do me a favor, write the word yes in the chat box if you've had to make changes to your daily routine recently and are looking for better ways to improve the quality of your food. Uh, I see all types of yeses here. Uh, it's a good thing it's only one word because uh, if it was one <laughs> word, I would not be able to read. So this is great. A lot, it sounds like a lot of you have had your, your lifestyle slightly disrupted recently. And you know what? Dr. Barnard's in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. The Forks Over Knives team, we're all in the same boat. No question. Uh, the, the truth is that we're all in this together. And um, that's why Forks Over Knives dedicates themselves to making products that you can use at home uh, to improve the quality of your life and the quality of your food at the same time. So Forks Over Knives uh, offers an incredible meal planning service uh, that I was just showing on my previous slide. And they've extended that meal planning service from 14 to 30 days. So if you're interested in getting your hands on this meal planner right here, uh, you can do this and you can do it and get an extended trial for free for the first 30 days. Uh, they've also doubled the number of recipes you can try. And so you can build your own custom fresh meal plans um, for the month completely for free. Uh, and for those of you who may not be that comfortable in the kitchen, uh, adopting a plant-based diet uh, may be a really fantastic option for you, for your overall metabolic health, but it can be confusing to know what to make and how to make that food and how to do it simply. So the Forks Over Knives cooking course is designed to give you the confidence in your culinary skills so that you can prepare a variety of healthy and delicious plant-based meals at any time. And the best part is that they're offering either, uh, they're offering their courses at 40% off through April 14. So let me share some of these, the highlights of the cooking courses with you. 
Okay, um, the first thing here is that the Four Seven Nights Cooking Course uh, are led by professional plant-based chef educators. Uh, they are presented completely online, 100%, and they're designed for you to participate at your own pace from the comfort of your own home. Uh, so you can, you can plan your curriculum and you can work around your schedule and that's what makes it easy for you to integrate into your existing lifestyle. Uh, the lessons run over the course for about three months, but the beauty is that you actually have lifetime access to the lessons and you can revisit them anytime you want so that you can get a refresher to make sure you fully understand exactly all the powerful information they're sharing with you. Uh, there are two fun and flexible courses to choose from, okay? The first course is, excuse me, sorry about that. The first course is the ultimate course, and it's an immersive experience that's focused on foundational plant-based techniques that will sustainably boost your skills and your confidence in the kitchen. The second is called the essentials course. It's a shorter course with lessons including things like knife skills and oil-free cooking and daily meal planning strategies to help you start your whole food plant-based cooking routine. Uh, both courses are packed with lesson videos, clear instruction, and a great selection of new recipes. Uh, you get over 100 whole food plant-based recipes. There's lots of fun interactive quizzes, there's instructor-graded activities, and there's special live events for you to participate in at all times. The beauty is that you can go through these lessons at your own comfort and at your own speed, and that's the, that's the importance. Now, most importantly, these courses are designed to help you learn how to cook the healthiest, most delicious whole food plant-based meals you can uh, for your whole family, and they will love to eat the new food that you're making. You'll never be deprived, you'll never feel hungry, and we'll hope that you'll be confident in preparing healthy versions of comfort food favorites. Uh, thousands of students have gone through these pro the, this course already. And there's been an overwhelmingly positive response. Most students finish their course with improved kitchen skills and a huge boost to their cooking confidence. Additionally, these courses are a great way to connect with other students and make new friends in the classroom and in the forum and support groups. Healthy, fresh foods are vital to helping your immune system stay strong throughout this virus pandemic world that we currently are in. Uh, you'll, you'll feel great knowing that you not only are you investing in your cooking skills, but you can build on these skills for a lifetime. And you're helping to create delicious meals that will help keep not only you, but your family healthy for a long, long time. So the next course begins on April 21st. But if you enroll now through April 14th, Forks Over Knives will give you 40% off whichever course you decide to join. Yeah, you can even purchase a course as a gift for someone else, maybe even one for you and one for a friend so that you can both enjoy learning something new and you can do it together at your own pace. And don't forget to check out the Forks Over, Neal, or the Forks Over Knives meal planner as well. And with that extended 30 day free trial, you get an option to play around with it and make sure you really enjoy it before investing in a long-term commitment. Uh, to, to get any of these, please visit www.forksoverknives.com slash tools, or you can visit the URL that you see on your screen, www.forkservantives.com slash cooking course, if you're interested in getting started with that one immediately. There we go. All right, Dr. Barnard, are you ready for some questions and answers? Because there's- Oh, uh, you bet. That'd be great. As we were talking. Okay, so here we go. Uh, a couple of questions that come in here. Um, what role do hormones specifically have in hair loss? Um, the short, I think the short answer is we don't know exactly. However, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, back in 1960, 1970, something like that, um, Japan had a diet that was heavily rice-based, lots of rice, um, lots of vegetables, relatively little meat, almost no dairy. And if meat was used, including fish, it was mostly a flavoring. It was little bits used to flavor the rice and vegetables and so forth, not huge chunks of it. Um, and then as I guess people are aware, the, the Japanese diet westernized. Um, around 1980, 1990, fast food chains came in and rice went down and meat went up. Dairy came into the diet. And, so, and several things happened. Breast cancer rates doubled among women who westernized. Diabetes became much more common. Cardiovascular disease became more common. But uh, something else was quite peculiar. A number of other conditions um, started to come in that had really not been seen much before, and one of which was hair loss. 
um, where dermatologists were saying that it seemed to be much more common. And so that elaborated the theory um, that it was that, that the diet change caused it. And without going into elaborate detail, um, hair loss, uh, co a common male pattern baldness um, is related to, first of all, genetics. You can inherit the genes that will cause you to have hair loss. Men, men have the genes and women have the genes. But the reason that men tend to will lose their hair and women don't is that when men have extra testosterone, that causes the gene to be activated so that you can then lose your hair. If the man were castrated, don't try this at home, um, then the, the lack of testosterone means he will never go bald. And if he was going bald and then happened to be castrated, I'm talking about accidentally in an accident or surgically for whatever reason, he, his hair loss would stop. So um, it has to do with testosterone acting in a person who's genetically predisposed to, to hair loss. Um, so let's say a man is on a very low fiber diet and his body has excess testosterone because he's not able to remove the excess. Uh, the presumption is he's more likely to lose his hair for this reason. Now there are other causes uh, of hair loss that can be autoimmune conditions that can contribute and other things. But typical um, uh, hair loss relates to excess uh, testosterone activity. Now, having said that, I have no, there has never been a double blind trial of vegan versus non-vegan to see if it would, it would slow down hair loss. But although I do have to say, um, I've got three brothers and my mother would always say, Neil, you've got all that hair. And the only reason is because you're the only one of my sons who went vegan. Um, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But that's about as much as we know about hair loss. <laughs> How about right now? Are any of your uh, brothers or other family members also vegan or plant-based? I'm hoping they're watching this broadcast because they need some encouragement. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so there are four questions that came in from Daisy, Christina, Patty, and Roseanne, and they're all related to how does a whole food plant-based diet help with either menopause or hot flashes or insomnia caused by menopause? Can you comment okay. on that? All right, um, let me go back to, to Japan. Uh, prior to westernization, there was almost no report of hot flashes at all. There wasn't even a Japanese word for them. And at first people assumed, well, Japanese women are reticent. They don't wanna talk about their symptoms. Uh, but very in-depth interviews really showed that hot flashes were rare, but they became much more common after westernization. Uh, the theory, and I emphasize theory because it's, um, because I, I think that's really all it is, um, uh, or, but it's a good theory, is that when women are on higher fat carnivorous diets, their estrogen levels are substantially higher. This, this much is true. Um, their, their estrogen levels are, are higher, and then when they reach menopause, they, the ovaries stop making estrogen essentially. And so you drop from a very high level to a very low level, and that then causes reverberation, re, you know, repeated waves of symptoms, hot flashes. What can you do about it? Well, go back in time and follow a healthy plant-based high fiber vegan diet for the 20 years leading up to, to menopause. Okay, well, you can't do that now if you're having the symptoms now. Um, there are all kinds of supplements. Um, in my experience, they're not very effective. Uh, things like black cohosh and others, you can try them. The, the safety profile is okay, but I don't think they're very effective. Uh, the one exception seems to be soy, uh, soy proteins. Um, some women use soy products like soy milk or tofu, but others will say, uh, I need the soy powder to get a more concentrated form. And uh, I would say that about 40% of women with hot flashes will see a very significant diminution of their hot flashes. They won't be gone, but they'll be more manageable. They'll be less common. And by the way, for women who imagine soy would cause breast cancer, it does the opposite. It reduces breast cancer risk. And for women previously diagnosed with breast cancer, a high soy intake also reduces recurrence. Um, so there you have it. My next two questions were, how does soy affect estrogen levels in the body? Because it's like similar. We are, uh, there's a lot of information that uh, suggests that when you consume soy-based foods, your estrogen levels go up and that accelerates the rate of uh, Breast cancer. So, talk to us about that. We'll go a little more into detail. I think it's a okay. very important subject that a lot of women are confused about. Yeah, back in the 1930s, researchers discovered that soybeans and, and many other foods have isoflavones, uh, genistine, and, and others. And they do attach to the estrogen receptor on a breast cell. And so that led people to worry that they would cause cancer. But uh, researchers have studied it, and, and estrogens do not, they clearly do not cause cancer. If you look at women consuming the most uh, soy products. Uh, I'm talking, say, uh, Asian women or Asian American women. 
those who are consuming the most uh, miso and uh, tempeh and tofu and soy milk have about a 30% less risk of breast cancer compared to women in the same culture who eat less of those products. Um, in addition, several studies have looked at women previously diagnosed with cancer and those consuming the most soy have the least risk of cancer recurrence. Um, so back to the beginning, if soy has isoflavones that attach to the estrogen receptor, why would that not cause cancer? Well, as an analogy, look at the floor of your car. There's a gas pedal. And if you step on the gas pedal, your car goes. But right next to it is another pedal, the brake. Soy is the brake. Um, you have alpha receptors and you have beta receptors, the soy products preferentially attached to the beta receptor. So for people who are at high risk for cancer, frankly, anybody, having soy products is a good idea. Uh, for men, uh, soy products do appear to be uh, associated with about, again, roughly a 30% reduction in uh, prostate cancer risk. And they do not cause man boobs. Um, man boobs are caused, you know, I'm talking about breast enhancement. Um, that's caused by Hank eating too much pizza and burgers and gaining weight and his body fat is now making estrogens that are causing that problem. Okay, yeah, got it. Very helpful, very helpful. Uh, somebody asked, so Carolina asked, can someone reverse Hashimoto's disease by going whole food by day? Um, as I mentioned, we, we don't have uh, randomized controlled trials. That's what I would love to have. And I think that should be done uh, where you bring in people who have Hashimoto's, that's um, hypothyroidism, and have half of them do the diet, have not. Um, we don't have that kind of trial. What we have simply are anecdotal cases, uh, but I can say we have a lot of them, where people who are low in thyroid hormone, they had Hashimoto's and they went on this diet and they improved. Um, we do see that, but I don't know if that's uh, uncommon or if that's the rule because we just don't have that research yet. Um, what I would say though, is there's every reason to follow a healthy plant-based diet Go on this diet, um, keep oils low, make sure you're getting plenty of, of iodine, as I mentioned earlier, have your seaweed or have iodized salt or what, or even, even an iodine supplement if you want, although I don't think most people need those. Um, do stick with your doctor, have your doctor test you and just see how far you go. Okay, this is great. So now let's talk about, we had a separate conversation once about how oil can specifically affect uh, menstrual pain and symptomology for women living with endometriosis and or polycystic ovarian syndrome. So can you go into a little detail about the connection between oil specifically and menstrual related issues? Yeah, um, I mentioned really three things that are, that are affecting that. One is cheese because cheese has, has estrogens in it that came from the cow. The second one was fiber. We know that fiber helps through the intestinal tract for your body to eliminate estrogens. And the third is fat and it's oil or animal fats, any kind of fat. Um, we don't know why this occurs. Um, at least I don't know why, and I have not seen any scientific explanation as to why a high fat diet elevates estrogen levels, but we know it does. Uh, researchers at Tufts University brought 48 women into the laboratory. They basically locked them up and they prepared different kinds of diets for them that the women followed one after another after another. And what they discovered is that if you increase fiber, estrogen levels fall. If you increase fat, estrogen levels rise. And it happens over and over and over again. And the, the young woman I described at the very beginning of the presentation who had terrible menstrual pain. And I said, two things, vegan and keep oils really low. She discovered that if she stayed vegan, but brought oils back into her diet, her pain came back. So we use both. You want to avoid animal products, that's for sure. But avoiding oils seems to be helpful too. This, does, this is not a zero oil diet. I saw some of the questions saying, um, don't you need some oil in your diet? And that's true, you do. But you don't the oils that you need are the natural oils that are in foods. If you send a sprig of broccoli to the laboratory, they'll tell you that maybe eight or nine or 10% of the, of, of the calories of the broccoli are fat. And a large percentage of that happens to be omega-3. Those are the healthy fats that your body needs. What you don't need is slathering salad oil, um, you know, or, or, or um, fryer grease um, into, your, into your diet. Those are, that's more oil than your body actually needs. Okay, very good, very good, very good. Now, uh, Fatima asks a very interesting question. She says, what about gluten? There's a lot of research that says that people who have high gluten intakes can end up with 
uh, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism or thyroid, an increase in thyroid antibodies. Is this true? Do you know anything about this? Um, I think it's possible. Um, gluten is the protein that's in wheat, it's in rye, it's in barley. And it's been kind of fashionable to go on a gluten-free diet for all kinds of stuff. Um, and there are some people who absolutely have to. Um, people with celiac disease, that's an intestinal disease, that's a, a response to gluten. And it's luckily it's less than 1% of the population, but these people have to avoid gluten. Um, and I would say another maybe 10% of people feel really much better when they avoid gluten. And by better, I mean they feel mentally better and their digestion is better. Um, the other 90% or so of people, they go gluten-free for a while and they just discover it's a pain in the neck and they discover it's a whole lot easier to just be vegan. Um, but I think we should re re retain an open mind um, that I think that gluten can cause unusual reactions in some people. I think it's perfectly healthy for most people, but if you have hypothyroidism, um, or for that matter, hyperthyroidism, and you want to go vegan and also avoid gluten, you can do it. And, and I think it's not a bad thing to try. Right, great response. Uh, Julie asked a question. She says, I've been doing whole food plant-based for about six months and I've seen fantastic results. However, I'm still experiencing PMS symptoms, including mood swings, changes in appetite, as well as bloating. Uh, what would you suggest for me, given that I'm already whole food plant-based? Okay, um, first of all, congratulations. What you've done is great. Um, and I'm glad that you, you've seen some results. And as time goes on, uh, a couple things are gonna happen. Um, you'll discover different foods and you'll discover different effects on your body. So go ahead and, and let that process of exploration carry out. Um, the first thing, let me just emphasize, um, focusing on plant foods is important, but keeping oils slow is important too. So where do we run into trouble? You go to the store and they've got the most gorgeous looking avocados there. And you bring them home with some salsa and you whip them up and you have guacamole, which is out of this world. And then you look up online the fat content of the avocados that you just ate. And nature's a dirty trick is that they are really high in fat. And that's true um, for nuts as well. You can get organic peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, really, really high in fat. So keep those things uh, to a minimum. And, and what you can do is you can test it. You don't have to swear off it forever. Um, just bear with me. And let's take maybe two months. Have it be not only vegan, but really exclude not only added oils, but the guacamole and the nuts and the seeds and so forth. It's just as a test, see how you feel. If you feel better, then you've learned something and you can then decide what you wanna do going forward. Okay, great. We got, we got time for two more questions here. Uh, Sally asked a question. She says, I'm a 59 year old woman and I have been whole food plant-based for four years now. Congratulations, Sally, that's fantastic. Uh, I feel great except that I have developed vaginal dryness. Is there anything that I can do to treat this naturally? Um, great question, uh, and very, very common. Uh, after uh, menopause, for many women, they'll, they'll notice vaginal symptoms can occur. Um, some women do have reported uh, improvements with soy products. I, my own suggestion is that many will not. It's perfectly fine to try it, but it may not work. So at that point, you go back to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, uh, I could put you on hormones, and that will help you. And that's true. It will probably affect your symptoms. Um, but there's two things to think about. One is that the most common oral hormone that's recommended is Premarin, um, which is the name comes from the fact that it comes out of horses. Uh, horses are impregnated and their urine is collected and a, a pregnant mare creates a lot of estrogen. And so it's packed from the urine into pills and the name Premarin is a shortening for pregnant mare's urine. Premarin. So when you discover that, that makes it rather unsavory, but what makes it even more unsavory is that it's linked to cancer um, and all sorts of other health problems, which we've known about for a long time, which is why the doctor says, you can take this for a little while, but not for too long. And you think, well, that's not gonna necessarily solve my problem, is it? Okay, one thing is that all of the other hormones that the doctor has available for prescription are not derived from horses. So they skip that part. But the other thing is you can get a, an estrogen cream, which you just use locally. So you're not swallowing anything. So um, there is still, it's conceivable that certain amounts of it will be a, a absorbed. But so far the evidence we have is that it is much, much less. Um, it, will, it will improve how you, how you feel. It will, it will improve the vaginal symptoms. Um, and the systemic uh, effects are, appear to be much, much less or even negligible. And so far, there isn't any increased cancer risk associated with it. 
Um, I reserve the right to change that judgment if we get more uh, data in. But my suggestion is do follow a healthy plant-based diet. You can try certain products. I'm guessing they won't help, but you can try. Um, and if you use an estrogen product, use a cream, uh, not the pills, and you can skip the primary. Fantastic response, very thorough. Uh, last question here, uh, comes from Polly. She says, I have anemia. Is it still safe for me to go on a plant-based diet, yes or no? And if so, what types of food should I be focusing on? Um, absolutely, um, but I, I would strongly encourage you to see a physician and find out why you have anemia. I'm, I'm sure you've done this already. That's how you knew you're anemic, um, but there, there's more than one cause. Uh, one common form is iron deficiency anemia. And uh, if you have that, your doctor will say, you need some good red meat and liver. Um, that's sort of 1950s advice, and there is iron in those products. Um, the problem is that along with them come all kinds of other undesirable things like cholesterol and saturated fat. Um, plant products, especially green leafy vegetables and also beans and many others have iron in them. They have it in a different form. It's called non-heme iron, but it's more absorbable if you're low in iron and less absorbable if you're high in iron. So it's the kind of iron your body's designed for. So step one, go to the doctor, find out why you have iron deficiency. And if, if it's mild, you can just begin with diet changes. Uh, lots and lots of green leafy vegetables and beans, and that's the natural source of iron. But follow your doctor's advice. If you're very low, your doctor might use an iron pill. Um, if you are bleeding, um, uh, whether, let, let's say you're a young woman who's menstruating every month, um, the diet changes that I described might reduce the flow um, each month uh, for the reasons that I described earlier. That's a good thing. Um, if you're older and your doctor is wondering about are you bleeding from your digestive tract or other things, it's going to want to do some other tests. Um, there are other kinds of anemia. Vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to anemia. So everybody on the vegan diet needs to take vitamin B12. It's very easy for doctors to check your B12 level. Um, so do make sure your doctor does that and then follow your doctor's advice going forward. But there's never a reason not to follow a healthy plant-based diet. When you do, make sure the green leafy vegetables are job one. Fantastic, fantastic. Very, very helpful. So. Uh, Dr. Barnard, once again, the information that you provided to us today is fantastic because, it, again, it connects your food with your overall hormonal physiology. When, and your hormonal physiology, as you've explained thoroughly, can affect many organ systems within your body. It's not isolated to only one particular location in your body, but it can affect every single tissue. And when you optimize your diet, eating a whole food plant-based diet that's low in total fat and devoid of oil, magical things can happen. You've seen it in your practice. We've seen it in our coaching program, and people in the Forks of the Knives team have also seen it time and time again. So this is really a phenomenal message, and it's very powerful. Uh, so uh, thank you again for being here, Dr. Barnard. I really appreciate your time today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. And a uh, reminder for the uh, 1,050 of you guys that are still here, uh, if you're interested in getting started with any of the tools that Forks of the Knives offer, whether it's the Forks of the Knives meal planner or whether it's any of the cooking courses, uh, please feel free to check out those tools by visiting forksoverknives.com slash tools. And if you want to go straight to the cooking course, which I highly recommend, please visit www.forksoverknives.com slash cooking dash course. Uh, it's been great. Thank you so much for being here. Stay safe, stay isolated, and we will see you guys the next time. Have a great day.